Thank you all for joining us. We're going to begin in just one moment. Please feel free to come down um, and populate the front as much as you feel possible. Thank you to those joining us by Zoom. We are so glad to have you with us here as well. We'll begin in just one moment. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you for join those joining us inside the room. Thank you for those joining us on Zoom. Um, today begins our second Dean Speaker Series event for the 2021-22 academic year. And on behalf of Dean Paul Karen and all of our deans, we are so glad to have you here. We launched the Dean Speaker Series in 2019 and have been pleased to bring renowned legal and faith scholars to our community since then. We are pleased to open our Spring 2022 Dean Speaker Series with today's event in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day and sponsored by our Newt Bar Institute for Law, Religion, and Ethics. On Monday, January 17th, we observed Martin Luther King Jr. Day at a time when our country faces racial and social justice issues, just as it did during Dr. King's life. Our theme for diversity and belonging this year is a community of peacemakers based upon Dr. King's admonition that peace is not merely the absence of tension, but it is the presence of justice. We are committed to helping each other and everyone in our community become agents of justice and bringing love and light to the world in service to others. For that reason, I'm especially pleased to introduce today's speaker, Allison McKinney Tim, the founder and executive director of Justice Revival. Justice Revival is a nonprofit organization devoted to helping Christian faith communities actively safeguard human rights through education, advocacy, and collaboration. Before founding Justice Revival, Allison was the Robert M. Cover Allard Lowenstein Fellow at Yale Law School, where she taught and supervised students in the International Human Rights Clinic. While at Yale, she also earned a Master of Divinity at Yale Divinity School. Prior to teaching at Yale, Allison established and led the Uganda Field Office of International Justice Mission and was a litigation associate at Latham and Watkins in San Francisco. Allison will be speaking for about 25 or 30 minutes, and then we will open it up to those of you here and online for questions, which will be moderated by Jeff Baker, Assistant Dean for Clinical Education and Global Programs. Thank you so much for joining us. Please join me in welcoming Allison McKinney Tim.
Good afternoon, friends. And let me start by thanking um, Dean Richards um, and Dean Karen for this wonderful opportunity to be a part of this esteemed Dean's Lecture Series. I hope you can hear me OK through the mask. Is that working all right? Well, I'm delighted to be here at Pepperdine Caruso School of Law. I feel a special affinity with Pepperdine for so many reasons. One of which is that many years ago, maybe 15 years ago or so, I was at the time serving, as you heard, as the IJM Uganda Field Office Director when students from Pepperdine, I believe, made that first trip with Bob Goff that was part of the genesis of the Global Justice Program here. So I, I was excited to meet those intrepid, justice-loving Pepperdine students. And it's been great to see the work that's continued to grow in your global justice program. Uh, and also, my very good friend and colleague, uh, Jeff Baker, has been a wonderful collaborator and ally over the years. Your community justice clinic has done amazing work to help justice revival form and grow. So we have so many points of connection. I was asked to speak today about Justice Revival's Faith for ERA campaign. It's an interfaith campaign to promote finalization of the Equal Rights Amendment in the US. And I'm delighted to speak to you about this. I'm gonna be focusing primarily on why. Why did we choose this issue among so many pressing justice issues in this nation today? I'll be talking about the why, which means I'll be speaking primarily from my perspective uh, as a human rights lawyer focused on the Christian ethics of human rights, the big picture, if you will. For those who wanna dive deep in the details, we also have that. And if you go to justicerevival.org slash ERA, you'll find lots of resources, including a detailed footnoted policy brief. And lastly, I want to um, just mention that <clears throat> I will be talking in some depth about difficult issues, including uh, gender-based rights violations, specifically uh, sexual and domestic violence. So I encourage you to do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself in this context. I want to start with a story from Uganda, given our common ground and the close connections I know Pepperdine also has with IJM. A story of the time when I was there, our work focused on helping widows who had been unlawfully forced from their homes, often violently deprived of their inheritance in violation of their rights under the law. I wrote a very short essay at the time about a case that meant and means a lot to me, a woman whose, whose real name I won't use, but who I called Gloria in this article in California Lawyer Magazine. Gloria was a young woman, four children, a subsistence farmer, her husband took his own life, tragically, and the people who she might have turned to for help instead chased her away. The children were scattered, and this was a devastating situation. Now, this was one of the cases where we were able to help by asserting her rights under the law to help Gloria return to her marital home. And it was a really joyous affair she was overjoyed, we were overjoyed. These are the stories we like to tell, but I like to tell. And I got an email about that essay, said from Justice Kennedy. And my context was Uganda, so I thought this is a Ugandan justice. It was Anthony Kennedy <laughs> of the US Supreme Court saying, I really like what you're doing. And by the way, do you want to come visit me sometime? 
Well, yes. <laughs> yes, I would very much. Justice Kennedy, love to visit you and meet you and your law clerks. And so IJM founder Gary Haugen and I went to the Supreme Court and paid Justice Kennedy a visit. Now, if you hear a little nervousness in my voice today, imagine how nervous I was. <laughs> I was like 32 years old and just mystified. Why is Justice Kennedy writing me? And Gary Haugen, in his kindness, tried to help me understand. He said, I think he sees the goodness in what you're doing. He sees the goodness in it. And no doubt, also the logic. When someone is vulnerable and they're suffering injustice, the best tool we have as lawyers is their legal rights. It's one of the best tools we have to assert their rights under law. And that was our work, and that was the project. I think it can be not easy, but in my experience, many people here in my home country of the United States, they do see the goodness in helping an African widow, especially those who draw wisdom from the Hebrew Bible. People do see the urgency of combating sex trafficking. And so we should. People do see how women suffer under Taliban rule and the evilness of an ideology that devalues women's equal human dignity. And so we should. But friends, I think what sometimes it's so much harder for any of us to see is the injustice right around us in our midst right here in our home place. We're here during a week when we celebrate the legacy of Dr. King. Dr. King who preached the oneness of all humanity, what in Africa is called Ubuntu, or in the words of Desmond Tutu, we are all bound up together in the bundle of life. So King famously said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And Dr. King recognized quite clearly the link between the struggle for black freedom during his phase of the civil rights movement in this country and the fight against Nazi anti-Semitism and South African apartheid abroad. These both reflect one ideology, an evil ideology of white supremacy. They are of a piece, they are interrelated. And yet, when black freedom leaders here pet petitioned the newly formed UN for some sort of help and redress, US leaders resisted that fiercely. Carol Anderson documents this in her brilliant book, Eyes Off the Prize. Those in power would have rather forsaken human rights altogether than risk the geopolitical disadvantage of a Cold War adversary calling the United States to the carpet on the rank hypocrisy of fighting a war in Europe for freedom from fear, freedom from want, but tolerating Jim Crow here in the US. I believe the question for the United States has always been, will we embrace human rights as a principled ideal that we apply with the same vigor and rigor here in the United States as we seek to do with any adversary or ally? Or in New Testament terms, we might ask, will this country take the plank from its own eye. See, I believe it is so much easier, in my experience, to see injustice elsewhere, far from home, because then we can cut off that part of our culture 
maybe our faith that we're uneasy with, that we're confused about, or even that we're ashamed of and project it onto the other. And hence, the post-colonial critique, white folk rescuing brown women from brown men. No one sets out to be that or do that. I don't think anyone means to. But the only way to avoid that, I believe, especially for human rights advocates in the global north, and especially in this particular country, is to be very conscious about the necessity, the vital necessity of taking the plank from our own eye. So I want to tell you another story as we think about what it might mean to take the plank from our own eye here in the US with regard to injustice against women because that's my specialty, that's my background, and it relates to the ERA. Years ago, as a graduate student at Yale, I was in a classroom much like this one, and I heard a lecture similar to this one. The Gruber Distinguished Lecture in Women's Rights and a leader named Zainab Salbi spoke to us about her work leading Women for Women International. And no doubt it was a brilliant lecture, but there's only one thing that I remember clearly to this day. One line I can quote to you from her talk. She said, I had to claim the I. I had to claim the I. Now, what did she mean by that? She had explained, yes, I am a highly privileged, highly educated Iraqi American woman. And I'm helping women who have survived awful wartime atrocities. And I can also recognize that the sexual violence I suffered was no less an injustice. And that's part of what I'm fighting against. I'm paraphrasing her here. But I know she said, I had to claim the I. And friends, I knew what she meant. I knew what she meant. So around this time, the Me Too movement was ascendant. The movie The Hunting Ground comes out. It features centrally the story of my undergraduate alma mater and a high profile case there like central to the film. So I sat in a classroom like this one, much like we're doing today, and I watch on the big screen a depiction of the culture that set the stage for a rape I myself suffered as a 17-year-old college freshman. Now, why am I telling you this? Why am I telling you this now? It's the first time I ever told the story publicly. I just told my parents last weekend. Wow. They were great. <laughs> Thanks, mom and dad. The reason I pulled this story in here is to say, I know. I know it can be so much easier to see the injustice somewhere else, anywhere else than at home anywhere else than in church, anywhere else than in our own stories. But it is so vital that if we're not to fall prey to the white savior industrial complex, that we do the hard work, that we shine the light of truth on the injustices right in our midst, and that we say, we will take the plank from our country's, our culture's eye first. I don't think God ever wants us to be a hero. God sure doesn't need us to be a savior. But what we can be, what we might be, I believe, in the words of Henry Nowen, is a wounded healer. We could be a wounded healer. And that's what I feel like 
I'm striving for, I invite you to think about in your career, we can be a wounded healer. And it's more complex, right? A great story has heroes and villains. But the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. So I'm not here to give you heroes and villains. It is more complex than that. But we all have a role to play in looking right here at home, our own communities, in saying, OK, US, will you, will we take the plank from our own eye? If we were to talk more about gender-based injustice, the list would be much longer than I have time for now. Child marriage happens here. Female genital mutilation happens here. Violence against women sure happens here. Four women each day are murdered by their partners. And that's an increase from three in about the last seven years. Who studied Castle Rock versus Gonzalez? Oh, wow. OK. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jessica Lenahan, formerly Jessica Gonzalez, has three baby girls. Her husband becomes violent. She gets a legal restraining order in a state with a mandatory arrest statute. And that statute is printed right on the back of the order. But when her, when her partner becomes threatening, the police refuse to do anything. And the result is the three baby girls are murdered by gunshot wounds to the head. And she at least wants an explanation. So she sues the police, and her case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in an opinion penned by Justice Scalia, our country tells her, you had no right, and you get no remedy. And the police had no duty to help you. Problematic problematic survivors of violence against women have had the door shut, whether they're going through the um, equal protection clause, whether they're going through the due process clause, as in her case, leading one uh, feminist scholar to say, women have been shut out of the Constitution on this issue. Our culture is shot through with injustice against women, which is of a piece with the oppression of people of color. And this is vital for us to understand. This is vital to understand. And so Desmond Tutu writes quite clearly, how can I oppose injustice based on race and tolerate with equanimity, he asks. Injustice based on another fateful factor of human identity, which is gender. Dr. King's predecessor, the early civil rights hero, the Reverend Dr. Polly Murray, she always insisted that women's rights and civil rights are two parts of one human rights movement. One human rights movement and I believe it's a movement that matters to God deeply. I believe this movement matters to God. One humanity, Ubuntu, one movement for liberation. The blows of injustice we suffer, those are interlaced. And the hopes we nurture for freedom from injustice, those are wedded together too, or hopefully, Maybe they could be. A good word. He's shown you, O mortal, what is good. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the case of the widow. But it turns out, friends, I don't think it's possible to do a very good job of helping the widow in her distress, if we've been misled to believe that good Christians 
don't advocate for women's rights mm -hmm. as such. But that's exactly what's happened in this country and in many dominant, powerful streams of the US church. I've met Christian leaders very happy about helping the poor widows in Africa, but vocally committing huge sums of money to stop something like the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, what is the ERA, by the way? What is the ERA? How many people feel like I have an idea of what the ERA is? Yeah, okay, so about half the folks in this room, the US Constitution did not include women, to be sure, when it was first written. The Reconstruction Amendments did not extend full citizenship to women, despite the efforts of advocates to have women included. And as you all know, who've, who've been in constitutional law, or you will learn, it's only gradually, case by case, that hard-won victories have begun to extend some measure of equal protection to women under the Constitution. But that is vulnerable. That is vulnerable. And I am not even talking right now about reproductive rights. Just set that aside for the moment. Everything women enjoy today under the Equal Protection Clause is vulnerable. Justice Scalia famously said that women are not entitled to any protection under the 14th Amendment. Nobody ever thought that's what it meant. That's his view. He articulated the reason we need an Equal Rights Amendment. He articulated the need Equality under the law, equality before the state, that, my friends, that's letter A in the ABCs of human rights. That is the quintessential characteristic of human rights, that they are understood to be universal and available to all people on a basis of equality and non-discrimination. And yet we've had a pitched battle in this country actively for 50 years over an ERA that's pending right now that some of us are fighting for to have it finalized because there is a legal path to do that. But the vocal opposition is religious. The most vocal opponents, I think historically it's fair to say, and to this current day, are Christian detractors that are actively lobbying Congress to stop a piece of legislation, to remove a ratification deadline, and clear the way. For this simple language in the Constitution, sounds just like the 15th Amendment. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged on the basis of sex. It is literally that simple and that revolutionary. What would it do? What would it do, some folks ask? Well, very clearly in the text, it would empower Congress to pass national laws to address on a national level the pervasive problems that I've named earlier. The gender-based violence, the FGM, the child marriage. Why is this necessary? A 96 federal statute on FGM was struck for want of a constitutional foundation. Part of the Violence Against Women Act was struck for want of a constitutional foundation. Women have been shut out of the Constitution on this issue. Now, friends, I think I'm nearing the end of my time. And I want to give you some good news. I want to give you some good news before we go. When I hear these Christian co-religionists of mine 
expressing fear, anxiety, opposition to women's rights, I take that seriously, I do. I, I did a Yale Divinity degree because I was like, I wanna be faithful. I don't wanna be a heretic. Am I missing something? Like, because I thought doing justice was defending rights and that's what we're doing. Like Justice Kennedy gets it. Gary Haugen definitely gets it. I thought that that's a project. So let me understand. And the best I can tell from my study over the years, human rights for a Christian believer rest on one or all of three foundations. What's the philosophical, ethical grounding of human rights? One, God loves us. Holy God loves each person, and that's an honor to be loved by the creator of the universe. And that honor confers or bestows human worth. That love, according to reformed theologian, Nicholas Bolterstorff, that love is given equally and permanently to all. That's one foundation. The Imago Dei, we're all made in the divine image of a holy God. God deserves our respect, so does every man and woman and child. And finally, the incarnation. Christ comes in human form, dignifies our humanity by taking it on, suffers, suffers unjust torture to death, is the human rights victim in the extreme, which says, God is with you, me, in our suffering. God is with us in our suffering and victimhood never has the last word. It is love and life that has the last word beyond whatever injustice we might encounter or experience in this world. So when I think about these as the basis for human rights, I just wanna say who is any of us to deny a mother, a daughter, a sister, our queer friend or neighbor, or any other person, equality of rights before the state. And that's really what our Faith for ERA movement is. It's a growing interfaith movement, hundreds of faith leaders across the country affirming we are all equal in dignity and worth before God the creator, and that means we must be entitled to equal regard by the state and in our legal systems and institutions. I want to get to time of questions and conversations, but let me close by taking us back to Dr. King. Many know he lamented that the dominant church during the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s was a tail light, not a headlight. And so we celebrate him unanimously. And sometimes I think in a, maybe a facile superficial way today, but the truth of history is that only a small minority of folks in a room like this one would have stood with him, much less put our bodies on the line, as so many Black freedom leaders did during that era. It would have only been a small minority. But look at what happened. Part of King's legacy was that Christian orthodoxy in this country changed. Christian orthodoxy changed so that you don't hear decent people citing scripture in very, again, facile ways to defend anti-miscegenation laws, racial subjugation, chattel slavery. The question was settled in principle. Now, the backlash is fierce. The actual struggle for lived experience of equality and equity absolutely continues on. And maybe that's 
you know, equally as challenging. But he changed Christian orthodoxy, and that is no small thing. And that's part of what gives me hope. The increased awakenings to the need, at least, for racial justice, to the importance of witnessing and naming white supremacy. Those increased awakenings in recent years, those give me hope. Those give me hope. And so I'll end on a hopeful note, again from Archbishop Tutu, who said, yes, you may have the power, you may have the guns, but you've already lost. So why don't you come on over, he said, with love, and join us on the winning side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Allie. Thank you for everyone. Thank you for your brilliant courage, your leadership, and your voice. I'm honored to be your friend and collaborator and colleague, and, and it's a joy to have you here today for this room and for everyone online and for, I hope, uh, posterity, as we were saying, Ed, this is going to live on the internet forever. And so wonderful. Thank you for being uh, here today. I'm going to uh, I'm going to invite questions, um, uh, but I'm going to take a little bit of a moderator and friend privilege and just ask my own first. Uh, so uh, because I think I get to do that a little bit. Um, you, you we've talked about this before, and I would love to hear you reflect on um, one of two questions you can choose. Why do you think that in the United States we are reluctant to talk about human rights domestically when we are eager to talk about human rights abroad? And or how do you feel like the, the uh, framing and the vocabulary of human rights, the ethical language, the biblical language that's used today creates promise or possibility to affect legal and political questions that we grapple with. And one example mm. I saw that you did today, you didn't talk about the civil rights movement. Uh, I think you intentionally talked about the movement for black freedom. And I think that that's a really interesting uh, choice as an advocate for, your, for the language that you choose. Um, so I'm gonna step out of your spotlight, choose the question as you like or none, and then I'll circulate for others in a minute. Let me go with the second one because it'll be easier to remember, um, hopefully. Yeah, the language is important. And I think, you know, as many will appreciate, from a human rights lens, we have these different categories of rights, civil and political, economic and social, again, interrelated. Um, we, in the US, I think, uh, we use the term civil rights to mean black liberation. That's what I believe a lot of folks are hearing when they use that term. And, and so I sometimes use it that way too, because it's, um, it's relatable. And also we want to remind people that, you know, all of these rights again are universal. And so just to kind of make clear that we're, we're talking about particular rights we want available for everyone and the very important history of white supremacy and black subjugation means this important um, movement for black liberation. And so I, I, I'm sure it's some of the readings that have influenced me being part of the reason that that I, I make that distinction. Good, and as an advocate, when you're thinking about those things, when you're trying to make a point in the United States yeah. now, what promise do you think, or possibility, why do you choose that language as an advocate when you're entering into the discourse in the United States today, mm -hmm. which doesn't largely use this language? Yeah. What do you hope to accomplish? Yeah, I mean, hopefully it is, um, provocative in the best sense of the word to really be specific and naming, you know, that it's um, black residents of this country that have suffered in very particular ways and that that uh, harm has this generational effect we know. 
Um, and so to draw attention to that. And, you know, the language of liberation, I think, is also both theological and socio-political. And so to tie that together as well. Thank you. Questions? Thank you so much. Everything you do is pretty much what I want to do. So this was just really cool to hear you speak. Um, and I guess I could pull up Professor Baker in an either or question. One's domestic, one's more foreign. Um, domestically, I know a lot of Christian politicians use the Bible and twist it to kind of stop women's rights and stop minority rights and everything like that. For example, I remember when there was an abortion bill passed um, a senator, I think it was a senator, some sort of legislator um, said, well, if a woman was to be raped, that was God's plan for her. So how do we change people's mindsets when it comes to passing something like the ERA? Um, I, how, how do we, you know, as young lawyers or as upcoming lawyers, maybe help change that, that mindset? Um, and then foreign uh, I, I'm also interested in doing the Uganda program for the, the global justice. And so if I was to go, how could I go there without that white saviorism hmm. um, mindset, but also understanding that I do come from a place of privilege? How, you know, how, how would that be best? Uh, how would I best do that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great questions. So on biblical interpretation, hermeneutics matter so much. Um, and here I think it's very instructive to study the history of the struggle against slavery and that the modes of interpretation that had to be deconstructed and illuminated in that struggle, that the hermeneutic shift that was made to say, no, everything that's descriptive in the Bible is not normative. Those are some of the same shifts that are needed now. Although, that being said, I'd love to hear what text that senator cited. <laughs> I mean, there's rape in the Bible. There's genocide. It's not normative. And so thinking about how do we read the Bible canonically in community, prioritizing the gospel, um, various other ways, and you know, the best book I know is Carolyn Sharp, Wrestling the Word. She was uh, my professor at Yale, excellent book on hermeneutic possibilities. Um, so that's one source there. Um, but yes, the, some of the divides, they start with how we approach the biblical text. And the whole kind of political, cultural, religious divide that you see even through U.S. Christianity, much of it starts here. Um, that being said, you know, the, the case that I made for you earlier about Christian bases for human rights, that was not feminist theology. It was very mainstream thinkers. So sometimes it's just the blind spots that haven't been covered in the literature. Um, let me, let me speak to your second question about avoiding white saviorism. You know, I feel like this is a lesson I've been learning over time. Uh, and I'm still learning. But reading uh, post-colonial theorists, um, very important. And I like to think more about being in solidarity and supporting, empowering the work of someone who is in their home culture. And part of my turn to Justice Revival was like, okay, I've been trying to promote cultural change in a place far from home, but can I go back to my own hometown and say, let me tell you what I've seen and learned about human rights. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, by the way. <laughs> so that was kind of the challenge I felt and heard. So we might boil it down to say, look home first, listen to voices from other cultures, and, and really 
empowering solidarity rather than than rescue for me. I'm going to start trying to moderate a little bit because Dean Richards said we're running out of time and I'm so excited I forgot that there was time. Um, someone says, uh, let's see, was there a question? In the I was going to look to, to Zoom and see if there was a question. I don't, I don't know if there is. A question so. in the front? I'm just going to go with Caitlin. You, um, you're there. Yeah, well, while we search. Um, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. I think this is a really important conversation. I'm glad we get to have it here. Uh, my question is about uh, finding a balance between taking the plank out of my own eye and inaction. I think sometimes mm -hmm. I get so self-centered like oh i need to do this work or i need to read this that i forget that i also exist in a community so like how do you find that balance and how do you do it well wow i feel like you're on the road because you're conscious of the need to do both right because it's you know i don't want to say that we shouldn't be concerned about global accountability for human rights violations or that going elsewhere to be part of the human rights movement is not or can't be important work. You know, I still absolutely value that. Um, but I think by, you know, identifying that it is a balance, um, you're already taking the first step towards that. And I don't know, I'd be interested if others or others on Zoom in the chat have Kind of have insight on this to share. I feel like this could be a whole conversation. Thank you so much. If I may, in earlier conversations, we were so privileged to have dinner and lunch together with Ali and have come to the conclusion that we will be having Ali and Justice Revival here many, many times. Because I think as you see from this conversation, there was so much to delve into. One of the questions was, around the legal argument for removing the time restriction on the ERA. And if I can say, I know this student one, we have some uh, handouts that Ali so graciously provided for everyone who's here. Um, to those who are maybe Pepperdine students who weren't on campus today, I'll keep some in my office. But to everyone who registered on Zoom, we'll make sure those get emailed to you as well. Um, so I think I that's, yes. And the policy brief that you have on your website. Yeah. Um, I'll hold this up again to those who can see it. And on the timeline, good question. So I'll just say Virginia versus Ferriero because attorneys general in Nevada, Illinois, and Virginia, the three states that have ratified since um, 2014, are the ones suing to say, OK, 38 states, three quarters of states have ratified. Time to publish this. And so in that litigation, and amicus briefs by the ERA coalition, which we've supported several of those, you can get kind of the deep story on the time limit. Absolutely. And just so everyone knows, the only reason why I'm wrapping this fascinating conversation is I want to make sure our students who may have class at 140 have time to eat. <laughs> so we want to take care of your physical as well as your your legal, your mental, your emotional, your spiritual health here. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us. I do want to mention that the next installment in our Dean Speaker series will be in March on Cesar Chavez Day. We will have Father Greg Boyle of Homeboy Industries joining us. So I hope that you will all join us. Of course, we may be having one in February in honor of Black History Month. You'll receive emails if that's the case, but please save the date March 31st for Father Greg Boyle of Homeboy Industries to be with us. Thank you again, Ali, so much for your time, for your dedication, for your faithful Christian witness as well in the legal world. We are also so blessed and enriched to have you as part of our industry. So thank you. My pleasure. And all lunch is available right outside the doors. As a reminder, please take your food outside to eat so that we can just be loving and careful of everyone in our community. Thank you to those who joined us on Zoom. Thank you to uh, Ali and Justice Revival as well. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.